welcome friends to this monthly meeting or monthly satsang meeting i'm very happy to see all of you again i have been through a little uh, rough health weather so my voice may be little hoarse today also i had lost one tooth and they advised me not to show your teeth but i said there's no harm they are only friends here so i think as you are one is missing <laughs> so my voice may be a little different so just an apology for a hoarse voice and been a little hissing in it this morning i was listening to a song sent by a friend from india of a poem that is composed by the famous saint bulle shah and sung by a very famous singer it was so beautiful the theme of the song was that love is more important than anything else it says that we forget we say god is love then if god is love then god should be the same thing as love and love should be equated with god and if we say god is love and we are all children of god then how can we hate anybody we are all children of the same god we should love each other that's the nature of god that's our nature our real nature is so then he goes on bulle shah to explain how we run outside to find love we run outside to find spirituality we find outside to find salvation we go to temples we go to mosques we go to churches we go all over running all over and forgetting that god is inside not outside at all we waste so much time running outside and don't look at where our god is sitting so he then says that by studying too much we remain more outside he even criticizes that we read scriptures and by reading scriptures we don't get a lesson that we should find the god inside which the scriptures are telling us that the god is inside we think the reading of scriptures itself is going to give us salvation to never given salvation so it's a beautiful song he says love is more important than meditation love is more important than salvation love is more important than god love has bewitched and love has intoxicated even prophets even saints even realized souls so love is to be given the highest priority if we are spiritual beings if we think we are on a spiritual path then love should be given the highest priority i entirely agree with agree with bullesh I entirely agree with what he says, because we have not experienced the power of love. We have not realized that love is the basis of all creation. That love is the creator. Love is God. We haven't realized it, and therefore we are demeaning love by thinking it is simply a relationship between people here, or simply a relationship with our families, or simply taking care of things, taking care of people is love. These are duties. in the indian scriptures they talk of karma and dharma that we are here born because of our karma because of our actions in previous lives but we have a dharma a duty to carry out that karma in order to fulfill our duty we do all these things now these duties are in born in us to take care of our children to be respectful to love each other to be part of a community to do these things they are all our dharma that's our duties and the duties if we do properly we are taking care of our karma but to regard doing our duty as love that high spiritual power that creates everything that sustains our consciousness that sustains our life here is a mistake we should do our duty we should fulfill our dharma and take care of our karma but it does not mean that we should consider this is love if you want to experience love experience it within yourself if god is within you when god is love you must experience it within yourself it is not outside even when you say you have a feeling of love not connected with any duty or any relationship that you have a feeling of love for somebody it's coming from inside not from outside that is why the source of love is inside us not outside and to be able to go with them it's not difficult we have made it so difficult after all 
we are using our sense perceptions to look outside. Eyes to see outside, ears to hear things come outside, hands and feet and smell, nose and all organs of the body to experience outside. Why can't we experience inside? When we have the great power of closing our eyes, withdrawing our attention and going to investigate who are we inside the body, not outside. Why can't we just sit quietly, as quietly as possible, make our mind as quiet as possible or ignore the mind if it is too noisy, too chattery and sit inside and watch the whole show. Watch what the mind is doing. Watch what our senses are doing. Watch what life is about being created from inside. If we spend time inside, we'll find out who we are. And if we can find out who we are, we'll also find out who God is. Because you will discover that God resides exactly where you, your consciousness resides. He does not reside anywhere outside. That is why the practice of withdrawing attention to your own self to explore who you are is the most important part of any spiritual path. Any spiritual path that says go outside and find will not lead you anywhere to God. It will lead you to rituals, ceremonies and get more involved in physical activity, more involved in the reality of a physical universe than finding the reality of all this creation within yourself. If you want to get answers to basic questions, very fundamental questions, why are we human beings? Why are we here? What's the purpose of being here? Why are we all so different? What's the reason for this difference? How did creation take place? Is it a grand creation that took place once and we are a small part of it? Or are we the manufacturer of this whole experience? These are very fundamental questions. And answers to these questions all lie within ourselves, not outside. And that is why if you want to tread on the spiritual path, if you want to be a true spiritual person, you should spend as much time as possible that you can devote taking out of your dharma, your duties in this world, to exploring yourself, exploring inwards. Supposing one is not a spiritual seeker, it even then it's good for a person who seeks happiness to go within. Because nobody has found happiness outside. If they have found what they call happiness outside, it is so short-lived, it breaks up. We find little pleasure and we say it's giving us happiness. The pleasure disappears, very often replaced by pain. There are so many cases coming to me every day, talking to me, telling me of how they were so fond of something and then it all broke up. And now they are in great pain because the greater their attachment was to those things outside, the greater is their pain after that. So what kind of game is this? In our own families, in our family life, we have little babies born and we celebrate. Bundle of joy has come. And we are so happy. We give all our attention, do everything we can to care for the little baby that's growing up. And when he grows up, we say, what a monster, what a rascal he's become. How different he has become. And how much we cared for him or her. And what is happening? It's happening. All the time we expect something and later on the same expectation becomes a disappointment for us. There's a great spiritual truth that if you expect, be ready for disappointment. If you don't expect, you won't have a disappointment. Can we lead a life of no expectations? Sure we can. Expectations are merely one side function of the mind. And if we say we live as we are, we accept what comes. Acceptance is a replacement for expectation. You either expect or accept. If you accept, whatever is being given to us, whatever is recorded for us, is our destiny. Let's enjoy it. Let's see the best we can make out of a program given to us called life. And then, no expectations. Whatever comes, good or bad, we expect. We don't expect anything. We accept it. And then we are happy about it. Just by giving up expectations, our life changes. And replace it with acceptance. Supposing we don't want to change, destiny will play its role anyway, whether you like it or not. Things will happen the way they are supposed to happen, no matter how hard you think to change it. 
People try very hard. Things don't happen the way they, the way they think about it. I remember a course I did in what program was called EST, E-S-T, Earhart's training. Mr. Earhart came and he gave that seminar and I happened to attend it. Now, EST or A in French means is, what is. And the main theme was what is, is. That means what is, is reality of experience in this world. What ought to be is your mental imagination. You can keep on saying it ought to have been like this, it should have been like this, this was not right, this was not good, it's a waste of time. What is, is. So why not accept? So if you accept, it becomes, life becomes very different. I am talking of those who are not spiritual candidates, but they just want to improve their own life. The change from expectation to acceptance changes your life immediately. It can be done anytime. And one can live life by, in the 60s I came, there was a great, great quote called, go with the flow. And everybody said, go with the flow. What does it mean, go with the flow? It means go with whatever comes. It means live in the will of the destiny already created. Live in the will of the creator, who's created all this for us. So go with the flow is no different than acceptance. And if you accept what is there, then expectations can be erased from your life. And does it mean no, not having expectations means you should never think of some nice bright things? No, it doesn't mean that. You can fantasize. You can imagine great things happening. You can imagine you are in a wonderful place which you are not. And enjoy that. Enjoy the fantasy of your imagination. There is something very true about that. If you really imagine things sincerely, feeling they are as real as this life, they become real. Now, many of you must have seen this book called Secret or the movie made Secret, in which they say the power of attraction or that the power of attraction attracts whatever you are feeling. And it says that if you really believe that something will happen and you believe it has already happened, it will happen. Part of the course in Est was to write down in a book, they gave us a notebook, write down what you firmly believe should happen. Way out, 10 years later, 50, 20 years later, write all those things and keep that book with you and check out after 20 years, 10 years, what you wrote has any meaning or not. Most people reported that what they wrote then happened. So on the one hand, I am saying don't have expectations. But I am not saying that the enjoyment of fantasizing what could happen with a faith and belief. Now that is where the rub is. People miss that part. They say, I want to be a millionaire. I believe I am a millionaire. I am not a millionaire. I never became a millionaire. Now that's not the operation of that formula which is called secret. That formula says, you should fully believe it has happened. And if you can't fully believe it's happened, then it won't happen. The formula also says that when you believe, there should be no doubt. If you say, I want to make be a millionaire, but I don't know if it'll really happen. It'll not happen. It's very difficult. Now, here comes another part of the secret, the part that faith plays, that you have full faith. How do you have full faith? With our mind working the way it does work, you can't have full faith. It doubts everything. It doubts all the time. It doubts and fears all the time. It's ingrained into it. It is built into it. Our mind is an instrument given to us with a built-in function called doubt and fear. It's built in for a good reason. It's not built in to make our lives worse. It's built in to make our search for the truth better. It is built in so we are not gullible. Anybody says something and we just believe it. Anybody says have faith in what I am saying and we believe it. That would be absolutely useless. Nothing will happen. The idea of making you a doubtful person, a skeptical person is that you don't believe things just as they are. You believe them when they are backed by something, backed by experience. So this is part of the function of the mind to create doubt, 
to create skepticism, to create questions about everything. It's a very good function. If no questions are asked, you'll be so gullible, you'll be taken advantage of by the whole people all around you, so the whole society, whole creation will take advantage of you, you'll get nothing. To question is very important. So you must question and must have a doubt to start with and then remove your doubt by experience. That's the method. Now, in order to have that faith, some experience is necessary. You can't have faith in something which has no experience to back it. If the experience is not exactly on what you are having faith on, it should be something connected with it. You have a faith that you are going to have a million dollars. A man came to me yesterday and he said that you told people that I will be a millionaire and I will give a million dollars to this organization which holds these meetings, Isha Institute for Study of Human Awareness. He said, you told me this, I believe it. And he brought a check for me and said, this is my first installment of that million. I know he doesn't have million, but he brought the first installment with faith that he will have a million. And he will have a million. The question is, the faith that we talk of is not based upon blind faith. Just because we believe somebody, just because we believe a book, we believe a statement, we believe anything, that's not true faith, that is blind faith. Living faith requires that the faith itself, the events that lead to that faith should be alive. That means they should be growing. Today you have one little experience, tomorrow you have one more. If that happens, that will be living faith. So faith also takes a little time to build because it's based upon experience. And you can't say that one little experience gave you 100% faith. People say so. People have come to me and said, you know, that experience was so important for me. I have now 100% faith. Next day, bad experience happens and the faith is gone. Faith builds with a number of experiences. Faith is part of life. Faith is to grow with experience on a belief system which is backed by your own personal experience, not somebody else's experience. And that's very important. We hear stories, somebody else has achieved this. We haven't achieved it. We, don't, we can't deny he has achieved it or not. We can't criticize it because we haven't achieved it. He has not achieved it, which is also a mistake we make. We criticize people for making statements that they have achieved some enlightenment, they have achieved something on the spiritual path or elsewhere. And we may have doubt, but we can't deny that they may have had. We didn't have. But when we have, then we can say we have faith that happens. So that is why on the spiritual path, of which I talk to you every time. There is no scope for blind faith. There is no scope for just saying, I read in this book, how much I honor this book. I just read it and I believed. It must be backed by your own personal experience. No matter how small the experience is, and the experience that you have, which is a small experience that leads to your faith, must grow in time. More events must happen. For example, people talk of coincidences or accidents. Accidentally this happened and they see a greater meaning in that accident than a mere accident. A coincidence, for example, something you are thinking of a friend you haven't met for 20 years. And you're thinking about the friend and thinking that that friend used to talk about this particular subject and I haven't had a chance to talk to him and next day you get, after 20 years, a letter from that friend. It strikes you that you were thinking about it. The probability of that friend sending a letter is so little, and yet he sent it. This is quite called a really remarkable coincidence. And this coincidence carries a message that you have inside you some kind of a feeling about that friend, about what he's going to talk to you, and that is being proved by a coincidence. Now, I can tell you, with my experience of thousands of friends around the world, that ever since they came on a spiritual path on living faith, on developing faith with experience, the number of such coincidences has gone on increasing. Here's an indication. If these experiences, which we call coincidences, they keep on increasing, that's element that is creating more faith. That is something that is creating an experience of more faith. That kind of living faith is the true faith that works well 
in, in the spiritual world, but also works well in the temporal world of this physical world. So that is why I say when we follow a spiritual path, we should have that kind of living faith. And then that itself is good enough. Talking of the love that Bullesha speaks, he says, all my worship, all that I've ever worshipped and all the worship are combined together, cannot combine if my beloved is displeased. If my love for my beloved is not good enough, it's all this can be wiped out. He talks with such strong tones about the fact that the beloved whom you love, from whom love is coming to you, how can you displease that beloved? That this is a big, big thing that's worse than committing any sin. As it happened in Bulla Shah's own history, when he was not a mystic himself, he was just a disciple, his master was Inayat Ali Shah. And Inayat Ali Shah was invited to come to a wedding in Bulla Shah's family. The master did not have time to go to that wedding. So he sent one of his own men, one of his servants. He said, you go and attend the wedding on my behalf. But tell them, I am attending on my master's behalf. So the servant went and attended the wedding. He was treated like a servant, not given any importance at all. He was made to sit with other servants. And he came back and, and the master said, how were you treated at Bulla Shah's family's wedding? He said, well, it was all right, but they did not treat me like your representative. They would have honored you so greatly. But they put me with the servants. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear Bulla Shah should not have done this. So he got displeased. Bulla Shah found out. He wrote letters to his master. Sorry, master. I made a big mistake. I should have given the same respect to your representative that I give to you. And I made a very big blunder. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Now, Bulla Shah remembers the poet. His most poignant and deep philosoph philosophical poetry has come during those days asking forgiveness from his master. And the master does not reply, making it more intense for him. He loves intensely. And he says, no, I cannot afford to displease my master under any circumstances. And he tries to go and have audience with the master who refuses, declines. He's so upset with that. Then he says, I must find out some way to at least draw the attention of the master. So then there's a wedding in the master's household. There the wedding takes place and they, for entertainment of the guests, they have an entertainment party of dancers and many dancers come there. And Bullesha sneaks in and finds those dancers are wearing ladies' costume. They're mostly girls dancing. He puts on ladies' costume and sneaks in and dances with them. When the master sees, he calls him. He says, aren't you Bulle Shah? He said, no, master. I am Bulla Shah. I am the one who made a big mistake. Master hugs him and says, no, you are all forgiven. What was the object of this whole exercise? People say, how can the master be displeased with a disciple? How can a master create so much intense pain, intense longing and pain? in the disciple that he created for Bulla Shah. But Bulla Shah says later on in his poetry, he says that was the real teaching I got, what the intensity of love means and what a beloved means. I will not displease my beloved, no matter what happens. The whole world may fall apart. I will not displease my beloved. His poetry is so wonderful. And this song that I heard this morning contains these lines again. No matter if the world falls apart, I will not displease my beloved. So I'm mentioning to you that in this life, we think we have love from everybody. We think we are loving people. We think it breaks up. It's temporary. It's not really love at all. It's either an infatuation or just an attraction, physical attraction, or it's mere attachment. These attachments, infatuations, physical attractions, we call love. And they are not love because they break up. They are conditional. They are conditional on a reciprocal uh, respond coming to us. If the respond doesn't come, we break up. 
in true love there is no response needed at all true love is always unconditional true love has no regard to whether you respond or not therefore to experience true love is very rare in this world but we can experience and that's where the role of a perfect living master comes in the role of that person who can love us unconditionally with no judgment if the judgment it becomes conditional if a person judges us where we stand how good or bad we are he can't that love cannot be true perfect living masters who come here they speak to us from where god resides they don't speak from the physical world their words may sound like physical words their body is like physical body like ours everything is like ours but when they speak they speak from the region of pure love and where god resides that is why their love is always unconditional sometimes people ask me how can we know that a person is a real perfect living master i say greatest sign best sign would be to see if his love for you is unconditional if it lays down any conditions do this then i will love you it cannot be a master but if his love is if you love him if he loves you if you hate him if he loves you if you kill him is true love there is no judgment in god now imagine that such possibilities exist in this physical world imagine how lucky we are or we would be to find such a person who can give us unconditional love do you know what that means that when you are with that person who is giving us unconditional love which is flowing from the house of god which is flowing from such kind our true home when you are in the company of such a person what are you getting you are getting all that you can ever desire on the spiritual path there is nothing else you can get later on and you may go as enlightened as you like you can become the most enlightened person and you'll find that the enlightenment you got you had got when you were in the company of a person who gave you unconditional love that is why this these perfect living masters exist they have always existed they have always existed so long as human beings have been on this planet why do they exist they are not existing for themselves they can have a quiet life and not even reveal who they are one of the indian mystic kabir says he was here four times with full awareness and for three times he never revealed that he had any awareness fourth time he was asked to be a master he became a master as a human being he became a master in the fourth life although he was enlightened in all four why are they here they are here because they are seekers of truth sitting here wherever there is a seeker upon this planet who is seeking the ultimate truth who is seeking the ultimate true home there will be a master a master comes here for those people who are seekers of the truth who are seeking their true home who are seeking pure love who are seeking god now this statement is very simple that if you seek god then you are a seeker but then you define your own god everyone has a definition of god some based upon stories we hear some based upon scriptures we read and we say there is a god who can do anything and he is working somewhere up in the mountains up in the sky up in the heaven they have put the whole position to physical plane they can meet a master who will take them to an experience an internal experience where they will see a great throne of god god is sitting there and you can meet him they see where god realized somebody else can have a different concept of god god is not form god is formless we can't see him but he's a power and we can appreciate the power if we are near that god they go to a little higher stage and they see that there's a formless god in the universal mind there's a formless god and they can experience that and think we are god realized then there are others who can say no even the creation of space and time where we are seeing formless things itself is the creation who is the creator of these who creates space and time who creates all this great universe they can go beyond and they'll meet a master who will take them beyond and show them there's a soul a soul a unit of consciousness which is creating this whole experience and once they get that experience they will be considered god realized enlightened and then there are those who will say who created the soul what about who created the soul and then they will go there must be some power 
even bigger than the soul. And they're seeking is for that higher power and they'll go beyond. And they'll find there's only one totality of consciousness. Souls are merely just separate points of view of that one totality. And these souls are now embedded in us as human beings. And therefore, we are God looking at the universe, creates the universe from different points of view. He'll go higher up. He'll meet a perfect living master who will take you to totality of consciousness. That will not stop the game. Somebody will say, who created the totality of consciousness? Mystics have said, there is a power, a nameless power. We try to give a name, but we can't find a name for that power that creates even totality of consciousness, that even creates God. There are hints of it. In religious and spiritual literature, the hints of it. In the Bible, John's first verse, in the beginning was the word. It does not say in the beginning was God. It says in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. Look at the opening verse. Explains it very clearly. There is a power even greater than the creator. And that power, the word, is what is really functioning to create everything, including God, including our true home, including such kind. And what is the nature of that power? Again, the Bible, it explains that when a master appears, it is the same word made flesh. The word becomes flesh, not God becomes flesh. Word becomes flesh. That ultimate power of the word has been the same thing described in other literature. In the Rig Veda in India, one of the oldest scriptures that is available today, it says the Nard, the sound, was the original creator of all things. And all things were created by that. What is Nard? Not N-O-D, but N-A-D. N-O-D stands for another Nard, I guess. The the nard that we speak of is the sound. Now, think of it. There is, in the Islamic literature, talk of Bhage Rasmani, the sound in the sky. In Hindu literature, it's the nard. In the Bible, it's the word. Study all others, you will find similar descriptions. Why do they call that ultimate power that creates God and the Creator as a word or a sound? What could be the possible reason for picking up a simple word like a word or a sound and describing the ultimate power even higher than God with that word. The reason is very simple. That word which creates our true home, that creates God the creator, that creates all levels of creation, that creates all of us. Right now, as we sit here, that great power can be heard, is audible, can be heard in our heads. That's why it's been called word or sound. It's the same power. It's the same power that creates everything and can, is audible, can be heard. Now, what can be heard? You have to describe either as word or sound or language or something, or unwritten language, unspoken language. You can use any phrase. It all refers to the fact that the ultimate highest power, which creates consciousness itself, which creates everything that we ever possibly know, and that power can be heard within us. It's amazing that such a power should be available, which creates the entire universe, should be available either within us. And where does it, where does it, does it ring? Where does that word speak up? Where does that sound ring? It has to ring within us, not outside. So there comes the question that all these mystics have said, go within to hear that sound. When we say go within to hear the sound, we don't understand what within is. We look around, everything is outside. We look at our body, it's outside. But maybe if we close our eyes, maybe that's within. We close our eyes, it's all darkness, so we open our eyes again. What is within? Within what? Now when it says, go within yourself, then the nature of self, the question is, what is self? And the self, is the same unit of consciousness, the same unit of life that the word is creating and making us alive and making us conscious and aware. So when we are aware, we find where does the awareness come from? When we have to look at something, we open our eyes and look. When we want to hear something, we open our ears and see. But it's all happening inside our head, nowhere else. So the short answer is, 
that the meaning of going within while we are in a physical body is going within this physical body into the head. And when you say into the head, then starts the, ex the real experience of exploring what is inside the head. Now, this is not an examination of the head by a, uh, a guy who's doing anatomy of the head or something. It's a, your own personal experience of your own head. When you close your eyes and say, where is my head? Where am I? Where am I talking from? Where am I asking this question from? Where are my thoughts coming from? Where am, where am I? That asking these questions and putting these questions to myself, you find it's some coming from the center of your head. Not difficult. Anybody can try and find that where do you think, where do you ask questions from within your head without speaking, when only the mind is asking, and you locate yourself behind these eyes in the center. No doubt it's called the gateway to spiritual unfoldment. It's called the third eye. It's called the nukta, the dot, the center, the point. So many words have been used just for the location of where we are as conscious beings in a human body when we are awake. This is only a condition when we are in a human body and awake. Don't forget human body is merely a creation. God is not a creation, God is creator. And God is sitting at the exact point where we are sitting. The truth is, that answer is yes. So when we pull our attention, the only thing that we have been given by which we can place ourselves wherever we like is our attention. With our attention, we can place ourselves outside. With our attention, we can place ourselves on a book. With attention, we can eat a meal and put attention on that. With attention, we can do anything. With attention, we can talk to friends. With attention, we can pull ourselves behind the eyes and put our attention behind the eyes. When we do that, whole experience revolves around what is happening there. The longer you can place your attention there and not be distracted, because our life has made us attached to so many things, they become distractions. But if we can gradually pull the distractions away and get into the point behind the eyes, the third eye center, and put our attention long enough there, our attention will be withdrawn from the world and from this body. And we'll still be there, very much there. We are there even now, but we, our attention is in the world and the body, so we think the body is our reality and the world is our reality. When we put our attention there to that extent that we forget not only outside what's happening, but we forget even our body, then we find we have another form. Now, where, where is within now? Not in this body anymore, because we have already dis caused the body to disappear from our attention. We have become unaware of a body. How can this, how can the within still be there? It becomes within that conscious being that we are. If we can withdraw our attention from that form and go within that, we'll find the, that form disappears and we are still the self and we are going within that. If you can pull this little trick three times or four times and go within each one of the form that comes up, you will discover your own soul. You'll know you are a unit of consciousness and everything else was built around because of that consciousness. Direct proof, direct evidence in your own experience. No need to listen to anybody else to convince yourself. You will convince yourself with your own experience. What if you can do more than that? Then you will find God, the ultimate creator. While doing this, you can find gods whom we have been worshipping on the way. And people who, and masters, who have only gone up to that point and thought, that is God, God sitting in a place in heaven, in time and space, have found it's only one level above here. There are five levels to go to totality of consciousness. There you find you are the one who created everything. You can't see God because you are God. You discover it yourself. This whole process of creation is coming up from there. Right now, in the physical body, it appears like it's there. When physical body disappears, you can see the whole world. You can see the whole universe. One step higher, you can see the entire galaxies and all the universe created here in the physical world. Two steps above, you can see the very basis of creation. The very building blocks of this creation, you can see for yourself. 
you go above that you find you and the creator are one it's one source and the many are being created from the one ultimately you can merge in even the word and see that the word created the whole thing and you are part of it what a wonderful way is available to us human beings just by becoming seekers of the ultimate truth we don't take responsibility because we can all our search all our endeavors to find who we are is a mental search because we don't know any other way of searching we have not been trained not been equipped to search in any other way except through our mind and mind is merely a machine mind is merely an attachment to our soul to our own self therefore when we are searching with our mind the ultimate we can find out out what is the mind you can't go beyond that the mind cannot function to perform any function besides itself therefore to go beyond the mind into spiritual realms into the realm where the soul only, only exists without the mind without the senses without the body to go to that realm of experience we need something else not the mind what is that something else that can pull us beyond that which exists beyond god love only god and love can pull us beyond now that love is not the attachment we are talking of that's the unconditional love we can experience with a human being we call a perfect living master that human beings love pulls us to such an extent it can override the mind it overrides the mind's doubts while we are here it overrides the mind's distractions towards pleasure in the second stage it overrides the mind's conviction that it is a universal mind that creates everything at the third stage it overrides the mind when we are in the dark stage of being separated from totality it overrides that and takes us back to true home so love is the answer all the way though we don't believe it and if we don't believe it all right try with the mind at least mind will take you somewhere effort will take you somewhere what's the difference then between that pull of love of a perfect living master and our own effort the two words that we use for these two one is effort the other is called grace when we try to do something it's called effort when the love pulls us it's called grace it's as simple as that the pull of the unconditional love is grace and our effort is effort how do they combine with each other they combine in a very fanciful way i want to see in my mind a a graphical description a graphics of what it would look like and i see effort being made a big effort hidden behind it is grace what is grace doing grace is making us put the effort but we can't see it it's hidden it's hidden behind the effort we are making and we are thinking we are ourselves making effort because we are seekers and there is a grace sitting behind saying you don't know what is love so i am making you do the effort go to higher place no it's not all effort grace is needed i failed in my effort effort becomes short and the grace becomes visible say yeah it's all grace my effort is limited go higher grace becomes bigger ultimately grace becomes total and when we look at the picture we say the grace all the time the grace made us put us uh, put our effort the grace made us realize that effort is no good grace is more important ultimately we said it was all grace it was all grace from the beginning even the effort we put in was grace why would a mind that is so negative put an effort to find something opposite to the mind it's all grace this love of a perfect living master that provides grace functions right from the beginning and goes on all the way till we reach our true home we are so fortunate that our seeking for the true home seeking for going beyond the mind enables us to find such a perfect living master who then showers us with his unconditional love and with that unconditional love follow the grace that makes us do effort and eventually we find the effort itself converts into grace what a wonderful system we are very fortunate i think we are all very blessed i'll pause and take a break from you